So I've been working at the intersection of computers and vision and language for a very long time. And I think the organizers invited me here because they expected me to talk about that intersection. But I'm actually not going to talk about that intersection. I'm going to talk about uh, computers, XOR vision, XOR language. And I'm going to have three uh, parts to my talk. Uh, the first part is going to be about computers and vision, but no language. Um, the second part is going to be computers and language, but no vision. And the third part is going to be vision and language, but no computers. Um, all of this is brand new stuff, never been before presented, except for uh, the, very, very, the material at the very, very end. This is a little bit of exaggeration. There's just a little bit of all three in each. So there's a lot of work on video captioning. You saw a lot of it uh, here at the conference on, this, on the oral session the first uh, day. And basically, um, it's systems that take video and detections as input and produces sentences as output. What I'm going to talk about now is inverse video captioning, essentially taking video and sentences as input and outputting detections. And essentially what we do is we have video sentence pairs as input. Um, we run a proposal detector to detect many, many hundreds of candidate object detections per frame. We link all of these proposals together with both um, appearance similarity measures and semantic relations from the sentence. And we solve a big graphical model and we output detections. But when you see the videos that I'm about to show you, what I want you to bear in mind is there is no background subtraction, no background modeling at all. Um, there is no object detector whatsoever in this, never at the beginning nor at the end, never trained. There are no object models. There are no per object uh, class parameters. Um, and there is no learning whatsoever. And there is no training data. There's no annotation of bounding boxes. Um, and there's, as I said, no bounding boxes. So here's an example sentence that you might pair with the video. The person put the cleaner into the sink near the cabbage. And we transform this into a logical form that contains both unary predicates and binary predicates. I don't want to get into the details of how that's done. It's quite uh, mainstream and boring. Um, it's done with the Stanford parser and the methods of Lin et al. Um, the predicates are soft, which is crucial. Um, and what's crucial is that some of the predicates are unary and some of them are binary. Um, basically, the method in a nutshell is that we generate proposals with off-the-shelf um, proposal generation mechanisms using low-level image features like edges. Um, we randomly sample whether they're moving or stationary. Um, and we track the proposals forward and backward over time over the course of the video using two different tracking models depending upon whether they're moving or stationary. Um, we rotate the proposals by multiples of 90 degrees. And the crucial thing is that we build a graphical model where the tracks are vertices and the unary predicates that you saw are unary predicates on vertices and pairs of tracks are edges and the binary predicates that you saw are, pairs between, are, are predicates between pairs of edges along with two different similarity feature measures. In order to understand how this works and why this works, what we have is this big cost function that's got lots of terms in it. We can selectively disable different terms and see how the system performs as you enable or disable different terms. And that's what I'm going to show you right now. So here is the raw proposal output mechanism. There's 200 proposals per frame. And the computational objective is to select out a single proposal per object class per frame that corresponds to the um, nouns in the sentence. So now here is just using the similarity metric. And you can see it uh, fails to detect any of the object classes. Likewise, just the similarity metric. It fails what to detect. This is similarity between SIF features and faux features uh, using a chi-squared distance matrix and an L2 distance matrix within the detection boxes. Across the time frame. Across different detections in different frames and across different frames in different videos. We have a collection of 10 videos in a code detection set. So just similarity measure alone fails miserably. And this is just optical flow. And notice that it gets the moving objects, but not the stationary objects. Here's a moving object, but it fails to get the uh, cleaner, the stationary object. How do you get, how do you 
because it has the detection boxes for each one of those 200 detection boxes. It computes an average optical flow vector in it, and it correlates that using the whole graphical model across the video. There's an pro object proposal mechanism which is not specific to object classes. Here is the combination of the symmetry measure, the, the, uh, the, the similarity measure, and the flow measure. Sometimes it works. But what you'll see is this is just intentional information without flow, and it fails to detect the cabbage, and it fails to detect the cleaner, and it doesn't quite work here. But when you combine all the terms in the cost function, you can see that it gets the uh, uh, cleaner and the cabbage and the pineapple and the cleaner. Even though the objects are not moving, it's getting both the source and the destination of the moving of the cabbage and the destination even though it's not moving. There are lots of examples. So I stress, there, is no, there are no object-specific, object-class-specific parameters. There are only five parameters in the entire system. They're held constant across all of these videos. Um, it's operating on collections of 10 videos, each which is paired with just a single sentence. There is no annotation whatsoever of bounding boxes. The sentence you can see written up over here. Okay, so if we actually compare against uh, ground truth annotation developed uh, through Amazon Turk, uh, we can see that where um, our inter average intersection over unit score is about uh, 0.42. Uh, if you measure human-human intercoder agreement on the same task, it's about 0.72. So we're about 60% of the way of performance towards human performance on this task. And if you ask just the question of how well do we detect the objects, ignoring the IOU scores just by thresholding them, obviously if you ask for a, a perfect overlap, you get zero. And if you ask for no overlap, you get very high scores. But consistently, consistently the uh, combination of the similarity metric and the central scores beats all the other methods. And the existing state-of-the-art baseline, which is um, just similarity measure, basically gets zero performance on this task. So there's a lot of work that uh, we've published. You may have seen the work we published in CVPR last year on a unified cost function that relates video and sentences in a lexicon to a score. And that allows us to run the system in multiple directions, to do inference in multiple directions, to perform comprehension and generation and retrieval and acquisition. But I'm not going to talk about that work here. Instead, I'm going to talk about a new application of that same general principle to a robotic path planning task. Here we have a uh, unified cost function that relates the path driven by a mobile robot to a sentence that describes that path and a lexicon and ultimately scores how well the sentence describes the path given the lexicon um, by way of a score. And with this, you can perform inference in three directions. We can perform acquisition, which is given a collection of sentence path pairs. We can solve for the lexicon that maximizes the aggregate score over the course of the video. And then once we've acquired a lexicon of noun meanings and preposition meanings, we can use this to take a path as input and produce a sentential description of that path as output. And then likewise, we can take a sentence as input and uh, automatically drive the robot to satisfy the navigational goals that are specified in that sentence. And let me show you examples of each of these. So we've, in our lab, we've built a custom mobile robot um, it's decked out. It has a front-facing camera on a pan-tilt unit. It has an upward-facing omnidirectional camera, and it's got odometry and independent control of the wheels and, and uh, onboard Linux and the whole nine yards. 
From this, we can take a sentence like this and convert it to a logical form that looks like this. What this is here is we have a sequence of waypoints that says the robot started out left of the stool and then went towards the cone that's behind the stool and then towards the table that's to the left of the cone and um, then towards uh, 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 the stool which is towards the stool which is to the left of the stool. And um, this logical, th these sentences we got were all naturally elicited from um, humans through Amazon Turk and uh, uh, we produce this logical form from these sentences without any grammar whatsoever, without any parse trees whatsoever. Uh, the technical details are in a paper beyond the scope of the talk. But the crucial thing is that we can take um, images from the front-facing camera along with video or images and video from the upward-facing camera along with odometry derived from the wheels, uh, from uh, shaft encoders and the wheels um, for a training set that's been paired with sentences that describe the paths that the uh, robot drives. So here is a sample piece of uh, uh, input from our training corpus. And we can take that um, along with the odometry that's derived from the shaft encoders in the wheel and uh, 749 more of these and automatically learn mappings from nouns to particular waypoints and particular objects in the floor plan of the, uh, of the robotic path. And we also learn representations of the meanings of the preposition, both in terms of relative position and relative velocity. So this is left of and right of and in front of and behind, and this is moving towards and moving away from. And then given these learned representations, um, we can take a video here that's derived by somebody teleoperating the robot with a remote control and automatically produce a sentential description of the path that the robot drove purely from sensor data. I will show you the use of the camera in a moment. Right now, this is running off of odometry, but I'll show you the camera use in a moment. So from the odometry, we are able to recover a path like this. And from the path and the lexicon, we can produce a sentence, a complex sentence like this that describes the motion of the robot through the floor plan. And then we can also take a sentence like this as input and um, plan a path through the floor plan. And uh, then notice here, Scott's not holding the remote control. The robot is driving uh, in a fully autonomous fashion under the control of the plan that's been path, a plan that the path that's been planned in order to satisfy the natural language uh, route description. So um, we took the paths that were driven by a human along with path descriptions that were either generated by a human through Amazon Turk or generated by our program and put them up on Amazon Turk for a second pass to judge how well the paths correspond to the sentences. And one question we asked is how correct is the sentence as a description of the path and judges had to rate whether it's 0 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80 or 80 to 100. And for our four different tasks of human versus human, human versus human, human versus machine, and machine versus human, you can see that, we, that overwhelmingly the probability mass is over here in the 80 to 100 percent correct. And it's basically at the same level of performance for machines as well as for humans. We also asked how complete is the sentence as a description of the path and we get the same behavior overwhelmingly. The probability mass is in the 80 to 100 percent. And that's true again across the board of human versus human, human versus machine, machine versus human. Um, and we asked how much of the path was accurately described by the sentence, what we call path completeness. And we get the same thing. 
And then we ask what we call sentence conciseness, which is, um, is the sentence too short or too verbose? It's either somewhere too short, somewhat, uh, much too short, somewhere too short, about right, somewhere too long, or, or much too long. And again, the bulk of the probability mass is about right, and the performance between human and computer judgments, and the uh, human and computer produced sentences um, and paths are basically the same. So in answer to Kevin's question, Right now, what the system takes as input is a floor plan which labels the locations of objects in a grid. And these are given arbitrary tags. And what the system learns is the mapping from the nouns to these arbitrary tags. But then the question is, what happens if you don't have the floor plan? And so we can apply code detection methods to the video from the robot's perspective and map the video percepts to um, the positions in the field of view. And let me show you this. We generate object proposals again with a proposal generator. We form a graphical model with a vertex for each object in each frame, plus a dummy frame if there's no object within the field of view. Um, we form cliques for several adjacent frames, and we put the proposal score as the vertex score. It's penalized by the implausibility of the world size and position of the object recovered by back projection to the 3D using 3D geometry. Um, and we have an edge score, which is weighted sum of the similarity of the SIF descriptors and the similarity of world size and position uh, uh, as penalized by uh, uh, a back projection of, uh, to the 3D world. So here is the video from the robot perspective, and it's detecting objects. This is code detection of objects. This is the result after we've processed a whole stream of 10 videos. Um, See, there's a, here, here's detections, here's detections, here's detections of chairs. And then what we get is a scatter plot of uh, back projected lo floor plan locations of all the code detections, but we don't know. They're labels, and we don't know which is which. So we can fit a cost function to this um, that gives peaks as to where we expect the objects to actually be in the floor plan. And we can form a, a contour plot, and we can find the, the uh, local optima to this contour plot. And then we use the methods from the previous slide to map nouns to these particular locations. And you might think that there was a spurious location over here. Um, but it turns out, actually, in this video, there actually was a chair off to the side in the corner, and the system detected, even though we didn't even understand that it was there, and it was not even part of our filming sequence. Um, I'd like to shift gears and talk about human language. Uh, so here's an experiment, in a nutshell, that we did. Um, there's been a huge amount of interest in the computer vision community in activity rec recognition of the past several years. And basically, what that whole effort does is take video as input to a computer to classify, and basically you get about 50% accuracy. Uh, what we did instead is we took exactly the same video stimuli um, in an apples to apples comparison, showed them to a human subject. The catch is the human subject was lying on their back in an MRI scanner, and we scanned their brain, um, and we didn't ask the human what they saw, but we read their minds to determine what they saw and by passing it through a computer. And uh, we get 70% uh, accuracy to 80% accuracy in the task. So in essence, we have this paper in ECCV, which is um, reading people's minds better than computer vision me recognition methods recognize actions. And here's a, a, the, an example stimulus from the experiment. Here's a video of someone digging. And the task is to label this video with one of six labels, and the obvious answer is dig. And we took this data set and uh, processed it by every existing computer vision action recognition method for which we have access to code, either source or binary. Um, and that includes C2, Action Bank Stack, ISA, uh, VHDK, Ryu, Cal, and Dense Trajectories. And here are the levels of accuracy we get on this one out of six force choice classification task. And if you show it to subjects and read their minds through an MRI, um, we get about 70 to 80 percent over here beating all of the state-of-the-art computer vision methods. And in fact, we did an experiment where, cross-subject experiment, where we trained our 
brain scan classifier on one set of subjects and then used it to read the minds of other subjects that it has never been trained on. And we even beat most of the computer vision methods doing that. And that's only possible if there's some level of similarity in the a neural representation across subjects to allow us to transfer the information that's learned from one subject to another subject. Well, we repeated that experiment with a different set of stimuli. In this case, we took the Hollywood 2 data set, a standard data set from the computer vision community, which um, has stimuli that looks something like this. And the objective is to label it one, with one out of 12 classes. And uh, in this case, the obvious uh, correct class is this. And again, we ran against the computer vision methods over here, um, and we did fMRI. And uh, again, we exceed the performance of, of, of all state-of-the-art computer vision action recognition methods by reading people's minds. Um, and uh, this is repeatable. We've done this over and over again with different data sets and different subjects. Um, but here, here's another subject that we did this to. But here's an interesting twist. Um, and I'll demonstrate this to you uh, by way of a simulated MRI experiment. Imagine yourself lying on your back in an MRI machine. You have goggles on your eyes. It's going on for hours and hours and end, and you're watching stimuli. And we show you this, which is both text depictions of the object classes and video depictions of the object classes. Randomly intermingled, randomly spursed, randomly jittered, varies across subjects. We change the font size and the position on the screen of the text and just to keep you awake, because if you were lying on your back in a scanner for eight hours, you'd get pretty bored. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now here's the trick. This is the computer vision methods, but if we classify verbs from video, we get over here. If we classify verbs from text, we get over here. Again, we beat every um, computer vision method except stacked ISA. But we can now do this trick. We can train brain scan classifiers on just the text stimuli and then use them to, to classify the video stimuli sight unseen. And we can train classifiers on just the video stimuli and classify the text stimuli sight unseen. We can do cross-modal transfer of brain scan classifiers and we get performance that meets or beats most of the state-of-the-art computer vision methods. And what's interesting here is this is subject one, who's a native speaker of English. This is subject two, who's not a native speaker of English. And you can see that the video performance is the same, but the text performance is degraded, which is something that you would naturally expect. But then we can carry this even further. And here's another simulated um, MRI experiment. You get interleaved video. Listen. And speech. So you can do the same analysis that I showed. And again, you can classify from just the video stimuli, from just training on the video stimuli, just the speech stimuli, just training on the speech stimuli. And speech is actually much more robust even than text. And you can transfer from speech to video and from video to speech, again, with um, uh, accuracy much greater than computer vision methods. But here's the trick you can do. 
What we've done to classify the brain scans is we have a support vector machine um, with the coefficients that correspond to the bold response in the individual voxels. And we can back project the coefficient, the learned coefficients in the support vector machines back to the brain volumes. And we can back project the video classifiers and you see them in red, it's sort of hard to see on the screen. And the text and speech classifiers and you can see them in blue. This is subject one text, subject two text, and subject one speech. And the crucial thing is, right over here, you see overlap of red and blue. Right over here, you see overlap of red and blue. Sorry, right over here, you see overlap of red and blue. So we can begin to get a handle on where the locus is in the brain for the joint video and language processing. And what's actually quite amazing is that this is different subjects and this is different modality of stimuli and yet the activity regions are very, very similar, at least as far as um, the accuracy level that we have in, um, uh, in MRI analysis. So I'd like to show you another study that we've done. There is uh, the current state-of-the-art methods in computer vision for classifying activity, or what I like to call blender methods. They're what are called bag-of-word methods. You gather a whole lot of features across an entire video, you chop them up, you vector quantize them, and you compute a histogram of the codebook entries and classify it with a support vector machine. And all the temporal information is lost in doing this. So is that a realistic model for how humans process video? We can show the same stimuli to humans. The problem is, is that in ordinary classical MRI, you have 35 slices um, that give you an entire brain volume image um, once every two seconds. But the entire stimulus lasts only about four seconds, so you only get a single or two volumes in order to classify the signal, which is very much like the blender methods used in computer vision. But instead, we can actually just, we can program our scanner to just scan the, a particular set of six or seven slices, and since we know that in the prefrontal cortex, in the supplementary motor area, in the, in the um, pre-motor cortex is where the locus of activity recognition seems to be. We can focus in on that area and then we can, uh, instead of getting a scan every two seconds, we can get a scan every 300 milliseconds and we can begin to see the time course of processing of video information in the brain. So we can take a video stimulus like this and instead of classifying um, a single brain volume, we can classify a sequence of two, of two brain volumes, three brain volumes, or sequence of video frames over the course of the video. Um, and we can shift this temporally to see where actually the processing is taking place and how long the processing takes place. And if you do this and you plot your accuracy of your classification, you get a peak around over here, which is around um, 15 brain volumes or around uh, uh, five seconds after the video stimulus onset, which is due to the hemodynamic response function. And if you increase the length of your classification sequence, the classification accuracy goes up tremendously. So if you very carefully tune where and for how long you analyze the brain response to a video stimulus, you can get tremendously improved classification accuracy on um, uh, mind reading. So I'd like to summarize with the last piece of work, and this is joint work with Andre and Stoddard, who are the uh, conference organizers. There's been a lot of recent interest in video captioning. Um, there were quite a few oral presentations um, earlier in the conference on video captioning. Essentially, it's take video as input and produce a sentence as output. And the question is, how do they work? Well, let's ask the authors themselves. Here's an actual quote from Guadaram et al. We use priors learned from web scale natural language corporate to penalize unlikely combinations of actors, actions, and objects. Essentially, they have, they, they actually describe this very nicely in a, uh, a figure in their paper where they have a joint graphical model between subject, verb, object, and prepositional phrase, and they have individual classifiers for the subject and the verb and the object and the prepositional phrase, and they have joint co-occurrence probabilities between the subject and the verb, the verb and object, and the object and the prepositional phrase, and they train these on billions of words, the, the giga, British Giga Word Corpus and Wikipedia and other huge corpora. And what this does is that the individual classifier looks at this image and classifies it as egg, 
um, but it, and, and classifies the activity as slice, but the, prob the joint probability of slicing eggs is, um, is lower than the joint probability of slicing uh, onions, so it overrides the egg detection and labels this as an onion. Um, and so the question is, does the brain do this? This is a very natural question that I think we would all be interested in. So we conducted an experiment to analyze this. Um, in psychology, we conduct very carefully um, cross-product experiments. So we have one of four subjects, one of three verbs, one of three objects, and one of two prepositional phrases. This is exactly the sentence structure from Guadarrama. And that allows us to measure the classification accuracy of the individual actor, the individual verb, the individual object, the individual direction, and the individual location of the action. It allows us to measure the classification accuracy of joint models that model the actor-verb pair, the, the actor-object pair, the actor direction, the actor location, the verb object, the verb direction, the verb location. It allows us to measure triples like actor-verb object, uh, et cetera. And we can do all of this ad nauseum. And we can even measure the accuracy of being able to read out an entire sentence. So let me explain to you what's going on here. Is we are doing image captioning by having a human caption an image while lying in a scanner. We read their brain and we read out of their brain an entire sentence. So here's an example of the stimuli. They're all very carefully constructed so that we have examples of every element in that cross product. Jeff carried the chair leftward. Um, Andre carried the tortilla leftward. Um, Siddharth folded the chair on the right. Um, and uh, Siddharth left the chair leftward, and uh, uh, Dan left the shirt rightward. We intentionally tried to make these humorous because if you're a subject lying on your back for eight hours in a scanner, you'll fall asleep unless there's something at least mildly um, out of the ordinary about the videos. Yeah. So the crucial thing about this experiment is not just that we can read your mind, but it's a scientific question of the question is whether the joint classifiers outperform the constituent classifiers or not. So we have two conditions. The independent condition is where we train individual constituents and we test on constituent pairs and triples just using conjunction of the independently trained models versus the joint models where we train and test on constituent pairs and triples. And here is the classification accuracy of the individual constituents. Green is chance performance. Um, we're only slightly above chance for actor because it's hard to determine the identity of the people. But we're way above chance for verb and object and direction and location. And then here is the constituent pairs. To the left of each box is the independent constituents. To the right are the joint constituents. Sometimes the joint are slightly higher than the independent. Sometimes they're slightly lower than the independent. The independent. There is no statistical significant difference between the, the aggregate classification accuracy of the joint models versus the um, independent models. So you might say, well, we just don't have enough training data to train good joint models. After all, um, people are training it on billions of words of British GigaWord and, 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 uh, and Wikipedia. Well, uh, so here, here's, the, here's the same thing for triples. And sentence here, we can actually recover an entire sentence from your brain uh, with about uh, 14 or 15 percent classification accuracy, when chance is, a, is about 1 percent classification accuracy. Way, way better than chance, 10 times better than chance. But we can measure, the, we get a stream of classification judgments for the independent classifiers and a stream of classification judgments for the joint classifiers, and we can measure the correlation between those two streams. And for across the board, for all of the pairs and the triples, the correlation is very, very, very high. And that would be completely impossible if you had a poorly trained joint model, because a poorly trained joint model is very, very unlikely to just magically match the performance of, uh, of, of well-trained independent models. Well, then we can also back project the coefficients to the brain. And you can see here, it's quite logical. Um, uh, the location information is represented very early in the visual cortex uh, in V1. Um, the uh, 
direction information is a little bit further downstream in the visual cortex. Uh, the object information is over here in the uh, inferior temporal cortex. And uh, the verb information um, is over here um, in the uh, uh, premotor cortex, the supplementary motor area. And this gives a little teeny bit of credence to the mirror neuron theory that suggests that you might recognize activity by imagining yourself uh, performing the activity. I don't know if I would carry that too far, but at least this is where the, uh, uh, the bulk of the activity is that's in driving our classifiers. So given this information, you can take the joint classifiers and take the pairwise constituents and compute their intersection and the intersection of the pairwise and triples of the constituents is basically zero for everything except verb and object, which indicates that there might be a little teeny bit of joint information, joint inference going on between verb and object and object and direction, but very, very little for everything else. And then you can ask the question, how much does the, do the independent constituents collectively cover the information that are in the joint constituents, in the joint classifiers? And it's very, very, very high. So this gives evidence that the brain regions involved in producing sentential descriptions of video, of complex video stimuli um, are largely independent across the constituents, at least as far as processing goes, and largely do not involve any co-occurrence uh, computation or co-occurrence statistics. And um, this suggests that the answer to this question um, is negative. And I think that that should, um, cause those of us in the, com in the computer vision community pursuing the current line of research in video captioning uh, to think a little bit about what we're doing. Thank you.